Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Royal Irish Academy of Music online guest lecture. It's a real pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer O'Connor Madsen from Sing Ireland, who will be presenting a lecture entitled Gender Perspectives in the Musical Life of 19th Century Dublin. Dr. Jennifer O'Connor Madsen is Artistic and Operations Manager at Sing Ireland, the national body for the support, development and promotion of all forms of group singing. Jenny is a music educator, facilitator and project manager. She holds a BA, MA and a PhD in musicology from Maynooth University. Her doctoral thesis, completed in 2010, explores the role of women and music in 19th century Dublin. She is the founder and organizer of the Women and Music in Ireland conference series and has contributed to numerous RTE Lyric FM documentaries on the subject. She has spoken at conferences both nationally and internationally and has contributed articles to the Journal of the International Alliance for Women in Music and the Lexicon of European Instrumentalists of the 18th and 19th centuries, as well as multiple articles for the Encyclopedia of Music in Ireland. More recently, Jenny published the book Women and Music in Ireland, this lovely volume here, in 2023, co-edited with Dr. Laura Watson and Dr. Ita Bozang. Jenny is, of course, familiar to all of us here at the Royal Irish Academy of Music. In 2013, she became the project manager for the RIAM Teaching Network, the Academy's online music education platform. And from 2014 to 2018, she held the post of senior examiner for the RIAM Local Centre exams. She then became the Music Development Officer for Music Generation Dunleary Rathdown in March 2018 and moved to the role of Local Music Education Partnership Support Manager with Music Generation National Development Office in January 2020. In 2021, Jenny was appointed to the role of Artistic and Operations Manager at Sing Ireland where she is responsible for the operations of the organization, as well as playing a key role in the artistic design and management of Sing Ireland's programs, training and activities. It's wonderful to welcome Jenny back to the RIAM today to present this lecture entitled Gender Perspectives in the Musical Life of 19th Century Dublin. Thank you very much, Jenny. To begin, thank you, Denise, for asking me to speak on my research today. And it is a privilege to be back with everyone in the Royal Irish Academy of Music. Um, the title of my talk is Gender Perspectives in the Musical Life of 19th Century Dublin. Gender perspectives in music and musical lives are ones that have taken up a great deal of my academic and work life throughout the years. And to articulate those perspectives that I discovered and looked at in the 19th century, I have to first begin by giving you my perspective that led to this work. Throughout my undergraduate degree, my love of the many scores and genres of music we studied was only ever hampered by the lack of women. The question of why there were no women stood out to me, especially in a class of 48 music students with six men. There were the tokenistic mentions of Hildegard von Bingen and Clara Schumann, but otherwise there had been no great female composers. When I began to consider postgraduate studies in musicology, I knew where I wanted to begin, by finding the women. My original thought was Clara Schumann, one of the few that had been mentioned, even if it was only in reference to her husband most of the time. But my supervisor, Barra Boydell, suggested I look at the women in 19th century Ireland. That, thanks to the research of his father, Brian Boydell, their names had been scattered through records and newspaper clippings and mentioned throughout his books. I followed Barra's suggestion, one that has led me on a 20 year journey of the consideration of gender and music, the perspectives on it, and how we approach it and what it tells us about exclusion and bias in music history. For much of my time working on my master's and my PhD, the path I'd chosen to find the questions and responses I received. Why just women? What about 19th century men in Dublin? Was there really any women involved in music at that time? And the question I struggle the most with, and still do, were they even worth researching? These questions were never posed when considering their male counterparts. Over the past 20 years of research, my perspective is, and always will be, that everything is worth considering. Each new element we discover provides a new possibility, a new approach to how we understand society, history, art, and music. 
with each area that we delve into and highlight, we consider a new perspective and new approaches to how we work. However, when I started on this path, I did question the validity of my research and of the work of these women. I began on the journey often apologetic for taking up space with mention of their work and their contributions. And for me, my perspective has changed and from that. Over the course of the 20 years, and particularly in the last few years, with the completion of the Women in Music in Ireland book, and delving into reports such as the work of Sounding the Feminists, Own Even Score, which is often stark in its findings, I believe that every contribution, contribution is worthy of acknowledgement. The women of 19th century Dublin contributed to the establishment of the Fesh Kiln, the development of the Royal Irish Academy of Music and its local centre exams, and to the first steps towards creating a culture where female music teachers and composers were appreciated and heard. So with that in mind today, I want to explore gender perspectives in the musical life of 19th century Dublin with you. I want to share with you the fascinating, trailblazing, individualistic and courageous work of the women that lived and worked in Dublin, focusing particularly on those who dedicated much of their career to the Royal Irish Academy of Music and its foundations and development. I urge you to consider them and what we know of them, what they achieved and how they were portrayed from your perspective, and in doing so to consider who their equivalents are today in your musical world. How can you support them, document them and showcase them so they never become misunderstood or forgotten in the future? Over the past decades, increasing recognition has been given to the importance of equality between women and men for sustainable people-centered development across the world. Initiatives that improve gender equality ultimately contribute to economic and cultural development. In the musical life of Dublin, this has been evident since the 19th century. My work and the work of so many others in recent years, such as Laura Watson, Isha Bosang, Orla Shannon, who's here with us today, and Una Hunt, and so many others, strives for the continuous recovery of women's past and their histories. In my chapter on women in music in Ireland, I began with a quote from Duran Najifer's book, A Ghost in the Throat, which I share with you for consideration again. Remember this lesson, in every page there are undrawn women, each waiting in her own particular silence. I would like to share with you some of those undrawn women from 19th century Dublin and how their work and contributions changed gender perspectives in the musical life of that time and all that has followed. In the 19th century, the role of women in music in Dublin and in the country throughout was mainly a domestic one, with Manny playing music in the home as a source of private entertainment. There was a number of females who performed professionally, mainly as vocalists. For many of these female singers, their popularity with Dublin audiences meant that they often commanded a higher fee to the men. However, their position in society was not a favourable one, and in many cases they developed notorious reputations with scandals developing around their romantic lives and relationships. The 19th century brought about many changes in Ireland's population, politics and culture. In music, as in all other areas, the country seemed to begin to find its own identity within the discipline. Over the course of the century, musicians, both male and female, worked at developing and expanding music making throughout the country and particularly in Dublin. While events such as the Great Famine had devastating effects on the population of the rest of the country, the inhabitants of Dublin managed to go through it relatively unaffected. The 19th century saw many changes in musical life that improved and expanded musical activities throughout the city. And over the course of 100 years, the seeds had been sown for many of the elements of the life that you see in Dublin today. In Irish society, the role of women was subject to a patriarchal culture, much like society across Europe. The prevailing ideology of the time was that women existed for the benefit of family and that their main role was to attend to the domestic sphere. Women's role in society was generally seen as one of submissive passivity, with prescriptive literature dictating their behaviour being particularly popular with the clergy and religious orders. An example of this can be found in a lecture given by a well-known cleric, Reverend John Gregg, in 1856, which was entitled simply Women. He presented his findings at Trinity Church on the position of women in society. And I quote, there are two things which you ought to desire, which it is your duty to desire, which it is your interest to desire and which is in the good of society. For the everlasting benefit of yourselves and others that you should desire, and these are excellence and usefulness. Excellence has reference to yourselves and usefulness to others. 
Society does best when each sex performs the duties for which it is especially ordained. In a similar report on national education in Ireland in 1855, another perspective was included. And again, I quote, after marriage, home is the abiding place of women, the natural centre and seat of all of her occupations, the cause of all of her anxieties. And it is a deranged state of society that encourages her to seek employment beyond its precincts. In truth, the continued increase in such writing suggests that the early signs of unease about the way women were living their lives were evident. While women were unaware of what were well aware of what was expected of them in the 19th century. In music, just as in literature and art, women began to question those ideals, their abilities and their roles within society. The central issue for women was one of autonomy and their ability to choose their own path in life. In music, it appears that the leading female musicians all chose their path and dedicated themselves to a pursuit that they believed in. This can also be seen in other areas of Irish society besides music. In terms of Irish politics, the 19th century saw many women come forward as supporters of nationalism and promoters of political ideals. However, the difference with those involved in music is that because of the causes they supported and their significance to the general history of Ireland, many of these women were remembered, while those involved in music were not. Whether remembered or forgotten, all these women, no matter what their areas of interest, challenged and contributed to change in accepted 19th century gender roles. And the slide here is just a brief overview of the most significant female musicians active in Dublin across the 19th century as performers, teachers and composers. And I'm going to introduce you to some of them over the course of this talk, but this is just to give you an idea of the top level musicians working at that point. Within music pedagogy, the 19th century saw the beginning of the female music teacher. And over the course of 100 years, women female teacher, piano teachers went from non-existent to almost equal to men in Ireland. And it is a prof profession where females have surpassed men in Ireland today. The roots for this career path began in the early 19th century, where its acceptance grew out of the 18th century perception that music lessons were seen as an asset for young ladies, creating social acceptance and adding to their desirable attributes for possible suitors. One of the most defining factors of success for women in pedagogy at that time was that they managed to maintain good social standing while working because it was a discrete form of employment. In the majority of cases, particularly in Dublin and throughout Europe, female teachers taught from their own homes, thus remaining in the domestic sphere while also earning a living. In several cases, whole families became involved in music. This was common throughout Europe. Almost all professional women musicians on the continent were born into families that were already involved in music. Leading examples would include Clara Schumann, Josephine Lang, Clara Novello and Pauline Bordeaux. They had artistic output in common and they all depended on it for a living. Therefore, female musicians were mainly working women who were not working class. Because of their area of expertise, they seem to have been exempt from social restrictions. While the women involved in music in Dublin later in the 19th century did not follow the European model, the female teachers actives in the first half of the century often did. An example of this can be seen in the family of Johann Logier. Logier is probably best remembered for inventing a device called the chiroplast, which was a wooden mechanism that was attached to the front of a piano in order to regulate hand movement. Logier patented this device in 1814, and it was first advertised for sale in Dublin in January the following year. It was influenced by his military black background as he had been involved in militia bands before opening a music shop in 1810. Logier developed and published his teaching methods and made a notable contribution to piano teaching on an international level, including on Clara Schumann's father, who is said to have used the best of several teaching systems in his own tuition, one of which was Logier. Logier was the first teacher in Dublin to introduce examinations for all his students, as well as public concerts. His methods were very successful, and after his death, his music skill was taken over by his children. Lozier's daughter was taught by her father and taught in his music academy herself before she married uh, Mr. E.C. Allen, a distinguished Dublin pianist who was one of the first to open his own Lozier Academy within the city. From 1819 onwards, the couple ran a very successful academy of music and their students were taught and examined using Lozier's methods and also took part in regular public concerts at the premises. 
The Academy was one of the best equipped in the city at that time with 14 pianos at its disposal in 1829. In February of 1833, Mrs. Allen's husband died and she continued to run the family business while also raising 10 children with support from her brother. At least three of her daughters followed in her footsteps. They appeared as regular performers in the concerts and later the eldest two took over the running of the Academy in 1866. Mrs. Allen's methods of teaching were always praised as well as the skills of her students who appear to have been extremely well taught. For many of the public concerts, all the students of the Academy performed with the programmes, often including performances on several pianos at once. The idea of student examinations and public concerts was one that proved extremely successful and it was an idea that was later adopted by the Academy of Music to promote its students and teachers. Indeed, it appears that when the Royal Irish Academy of Music first opened, its biggest rival for business in the capital was Mrs. Allen's Academy. The school was also noted in early records as a source of inspiration to the founders of the Royal Irish Academy of Music. They saw the success that it had achieved and wanted to emulate something similar that could be recognised as a national institution of music. The establishment of the Royal Irish Academy of Music would eventually lead to more professional opportunities for women, but not from the beginning. In its early years, it was open only to male students and staff. It took eight years and the reorganisation of the institution before its benefits for female musicians in Ireland became evident. The first steps to creating an Irish Academy appeared in 1848 in the form of a prospectus, which argued that a country that was celebrated for its musical taste should have an institution through which it could provide training for its own musicians. There was also a sense that it would help to establish Ireland as culturally separated from England and that it would help inspire a sense of irony, Irishness in Dublin musicians. For a country that had a reputation of being musical, Ireland was lacking the educational opportunities that would be required to improve the standards of musical performance and education so that they were comparable to London or the rest of Europe. While the many privately owned music academies that had developed in the first half of the century were important for the growth of music, there needed to be a place that would set the standards and provide tuition that would echo that of musical institutions across Europe. With the reorganisation of the RIAM in 1856, the directors appointed Fanny Robinson as a supervisor to all the female students and as a professor of the piano along with her husband, Joseph Robinson. Frances or Fanny Arthur Robinson was a teacher, composer and pianist originally from Southampton. Her early education was guided by Sterndale Bennett and Thalberg in the UK. She came to Dublin in 1849 for her first professional performance, where her playing was re reviewed with great praise in the Freeman's Journal the following day. And I quote, we cannot avoid once more advertising the extraordinary and exquisite performance of Miss Arthur on the piano forte. She was on chord with enthusiasm. The concert became important on a personal level as well as a professional one to Miss Arthur, as it was the setting for her first meeting with her future husband, Joseph Robinson. Robinson was a well-known personality on the Dublin music scene and an important influence on music in Dublin as a conductor, composer and baritone. They were married just four months after they met and from 1849, Fanny Robinson became a regular performer in Dublin, often in concerts her husband was performing in too. Over the course of the following decade, she also returned to England for a number of solo performances in London, and in 1864, she gave her first performance in Paris in the Salle Royal. When Fanny Robinson joined the staff of the RIAM, sorry, excuse me, their treatment of her was progressive for the time. She was in a position of importance and taught both male and female students. This was unusual in comparison to the rest of Europe, where there were very few female teachers, and those that were employed were only allowed to teach female students. Her salary was also a clear illustration of the position she held at a time when women could only hold certain forms of employment and where the sphere of control and gender dynamics was a topic that was regularly debated within the press and the church of the time. Fanny was in a position of authority and earning an amount equal to her male colleagues and considering in many areas that gender pay gaps are still a significant issue today. This further illustrates what she had achieved. Given her well-established reputation as a performer in 1856, it is likely that the RIAM director saw her as a means of attracting students, especially female ones, by adding a reputable female pianist and composer to their teaching staff. In an article by Annie Patterson for the Weekly Irish Times in 1900, the author mentions that the appointment of Fanny Robinson as a professor of the pianoforte at the RIAM 
drew a large number of pupils to the school, Dublin School of Music. The article goes on to describe her as brilliantly clever woman with a charming personality. Fanny Robinson continued to teach in the RAM until 1875, and in addition to her teaching and performing career, she is notable as one of the first professional female composers in Ireland, in that she had her music published and performed. While the role of teacher, women as teachers was increasingly accepted in the 19th century within the discipline of composition, they met with a lot of opposition from men. This may be attributed to the many male historians, philosophers and musicians who voiced their opinions on women's inability to be creative. For example, in the words of the conductor and pianist Hans von Bülow, and I quote, reproductive genius can be admitted to the pretty sex, but productive genius unconditionally cannot. There will never be a woman composer, at best a misprinting copyist. I do not believe in the feminine form of the word creator. Many of these opinions followed on from those of philosophers from the 18th century, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who stated that, and again, a quote, women in general have no genius. The celestial flame which warms and sets fire to the soul, the genius which consumes and devours, that burning eloquence, those sublime transports which carry their raptures to the depths of the hearts, will always be lacking in the writing of women. Their works are cold and pretty as they are. They may contain as much wish as you please, but never a soul. They are a hundred times more sensible than passionate. And I don't know about you, but for me, that quote in particular is very ironic, given what we now know of women composers and women across all forms of art. As a result of these opinions, women composers were usually discouraged from pursuing composition as anything other than a pastime. And in many cases, the negative social attitudes led to doubt in their ability. The treatment of female composers in Ireland, and especially in Dublin, was quite different to the rest of Europe. In his inaugural lecture in October 1856 for the or Royal Irish Academy of Music, Professor Smith spoke of the simple need for education in harmony to supplement the Irish natural musical personality. Therefore, when composers began to appear, their music was appreciated, performed and praised by their male peers in Dublin. In many ways, this was a result of the fact that composition and music theory and also harmony classes were relatively new to the country. And in many ways, the educational opportunities were not comparable to mainland Europe yet. 19th century Dublin saw a surge in printed music from both male and female composers who were active in musical life in the city. For Fanny Robinson, she began composing shortly after she moved to Ireland and her compositional output consisted of piano pieces and one sacred cantata, God is Love. Her work as a composer was defined by her cantata, which was what she became best remembered for. The work went largely forgotten for over 100 years until a copy was found in the Academy Library and excerpts were performed by Deborah Kelleher and the late Elizabeth Pink at the first conference on women in music in Ireland in 2010. In terms of her piano music, there is no record of Fanny Robinson performing it herself, which is unusual in comparison to her European counterparts. Therefore, it's likely that her piano music was composed to supplement her teaching materials and also to provide friends and students with simple pieces to learn that would suit their ability. This theory is supported by the fact that many of her compositions are dedicated to the families of those she taught or knew through her performances. And if you take a look at the score here on the screen, you can see just some handwriting in the top corner, which is believed to be in the composer's own hand, where she dedicated it to a student she was teaching in the academy at the time. Through her compositions, Robinson, Robinson provided inspiration for her students and other female composers to try to have their music published or performed, or even both. She was proof that a woman could now achieve that in Ireland. And I'm just going to play you. Is that okay?
and an abrupt stop. Ap apologies, but I'm just going to move on because of time. After her death, unfortunately, the work of Fanny Robinson became largely forgotten, and her story, when revisited throughout the 19th and 20th century, became more about her husband's reputation and indiscretions than her talent and ability. Notably, this retelling of her story was always by male authors. From the beginning of their marriage, Fanny Robinson worked under the name Mrs. Joseph Robinson, which seems unusual by European comparisons, but common practice in Ireland. While her husband was well known throughout Dublin, in London and Paris, his name for Manny became synonymous with his wife's talents, as can be seen in references by Clara Schumann to the couple. Schumann refers to them as setting the musical tone in the Irish capital. He is a singing master and she is a pianist. And she goes on to describe their marriage, noting the following, and I quote, They two lived very happily together, though one looks in vain for the comforts of home life. They earn money from morning till night, and each of them snatches a mouthful of snood, snood, food, whenever they can find time for it. Not till late at night do they meet when they are half dead, worn out by the burden of the day. Throughout her career, it's well known that Fanny Robinson suffered from depression, and from the early 1860s, it was during one of these periods of suffering that she composed her cantata throughout the, the 1860s. And she refers to this illness in the preface of the work. Her life ended tragically around nine o'clock in the morning of the 31st of October, 1879, when she died by suicide. Depression and mental illness was a common occurrence, particularly in women in 19th century Ireland. Mental disorders amongst Irish women were in many cases a result of their social situation and living under the constraints of a very narrow definition of femininity. Also, in many cases, the growth in the number of women suffering from depression was as a result of the changing roles of women. If a woman was to stand up to her husband or disagree with the constraints upon her, she was often deemed to be suffering from a mental disorder, which caused her to rebel against her subordination. In Fanny Robinson's case, consider whose perspective should live on. That of the many peers, musicians, and even Clara Schumann, or that of the sensationalist male journalists who reduced her achievements to speculation and gossip about her mental health and marriage at the end of her life. This portrayal of women in music is not new and has also not disappeared in today's culture. For all that Fanny Robinson achieved, her history was defined by the men that followed until recent years. I'm grateful to every scholar and musician who has helped to change that perspective. Following this thread, another female who made significant contributions to the musical life in Dublin, but whose story has become more about the men in her life is that of Edith Oldham. Oldham was connected with the Royal Irish Academy of Music for over 50 years through her time as both a student and a teacher. She was born in 1865 and she began her tuition at the Royal Irish Academy of Music when she was in her early teens with Margaret O'Hay and her teacher, I'm sorry, with Margaret O'Hay as her teacher and Margaret herself had been a student of Fanny Robinson. In 1883, Oldham was one of three students who received a scholarship to study at the newly opened Royal College of Music in London. This scholarship and the subsequent move to London led to one of the most important friendships of Oldham's life with George Grove, the editor of the first edition of the Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians. She studied at the Royal College of Music from 1883 until 1887, before returning to Dublin, where she took up a post as a teacher in the Royal Irish Academy of Music and was one of the founders and organisers of the early years of the Fesh Kill, believing in the need for an event that celebrated the culmination of Irish talent in music. On her return from London in 1896, Edith began teaching at the Academy and stayed there until she died in 1950. She was the first piano professor to be listed as having a diploma, and Oldham remained loyal to the institution that had launched her career. She was honoured by the board in 1938 when she received a fellowship of the RIAM, along with Annie Irwin, and later in 1968, 18 years after her death, the Edith Best Scholarship was created for the best young competitor under eight. Her relationship with George Grove has proven to be an important one, and his letters to her have become a valuable resource in the many biographies, papers and chapters that have been dedicated to his life and work. However, in many ways, Oldham's significance has been belittled by perceptions on who she was and the type of relationship that existed. It appears that George Grove thought a lot of Edith Oldham, and upon her arrival in London as a student of the RCM, they became close friends, and this was a relationship that continued until his death in 1900. 
The relationship is documented in letters from George Grove to Oldham from 1883 until 1899. It is a relationship that resulted in many assumptions being made about the nature of their involvement. It would be hard to prove the depth of their friendship, particularly as none of Oldham's letters exist, so we are only left with half of the story. The letters do provide a valuable source of information on Oldham's time in London, even if it is from George's point of view. In many of the letters, Grove offers advice to Oldham on her practice and how to approach it, suggesting that she regularly sought his opinion and guidance. He suggested concerts and talks of performances that took place. Often when she was at home in Dublin, he wrote to tell her what she should be practicing before her return. The letters in the early years are very much orientated around her studies, and there are not as many in the later years when she is back in Dublin. Over the course of the letters, the style of them become more informal and contain information on George Grove's own life, including his work at the RCM. In one letter from 1886, Grove wrote that he was particularly concerned about the progress of his dictionary and often complained about how behind he was or that he had a lot of work to do in it. Again, something that many musicians will definitely relate to. However, he does continue to take a great interest in Oldham's work and her piano practice. His words are always encouraging and he, always, he was always aware of what she was doing and what pieces she was learning or performing. The letters between Grove and Oldham are housed in the library of the Royal College of Music in London. There are 707 letters in all. They were originally sent to a publisher in 1916 by the executor of Edith Oldham's husband's will, but the publisher was not interested and they were returned to the Royal College of Music. In the late 1980s, Celia Clark, who was a librarian at the college, decided to transcribe the letters. Her transcriptions are also all handwritten and include Edith Oldham's mother's letters as well as those from George Grove. Extracts from the letters and an evaluation of their content has been included in Percy Young's 1980 biography on George Grove and in an intermezzo in the 1998 publication on the Royal Irish Academy of Music to Talent Alone. At the end of the intermezzo, the suggestion is made the task of recording the friendship of George Grove and Edith Oldham has been completed, which is an op opinion that I have long disputed. Both books offer a very restricted insight into the relationship, focusing on similar letters, a fact that has often led me to wonder if they actually read all 707 of them. Both also seem to believe that this relationship was a love affair of sorts. Through correspondence with Catherine Ferguson in 2006, a relative of Edith Oldham, it seems that this suggestion of a liaison between Grove and Oldham is one that caused great upset to the Oldham family throughout history. While George Grove definitely held Oldham in high esteem, the suggestion of their relationship being a love affair appears to be unfair and very much unsupported in the letters. While the letters are often affectionate, particularly in how they were signed off, this seems to have been more a style of 19th century letter writing than proof of anything else. Oldham kept the letters throughout her life, most likely because she was aware of George Grove's importance and his contribution to music. For 16 years, he was also an influential part of her life, offering advice and encouragement on her career and direction and wisdom in all areas. His letters probably meant a great deal to her, and she kept them as a reminder of her friend and her advisor. While women in the 19th century show skill, dedication and devotion to music, that is worthy of a great deal of exploration and recognition. As we can see, the stories told were often of the men that they worked with. Exploring their work in greater detail changes our understanding of the developments and landscape of the time. In terms of finding the resources and information for many of the women I've mentioned above, they were not often referenced or written about in great detail until the work of another woman from the Royal Irish Academy of Music. And this was Annie Patterson. Annie Patterson herself was an organist, composer, lecturer, conductor, and author. And many of the details, reviews, and descriptions of the leading female musicians of the time were captured from the newspapers and histories that she would write. She was born in County Armagh and she became a student at the Royal Irish Academy of Music in 1875 at the age of just seven. She attended piano lessons with Miss Kelly and elementary harmony classes with Robert Stewart. She later went on to study the organ with Stuart, and during her time studying there, she was also a member of the Academy Choir. In conjunction with her practical music education, Patterson studied for a BA and Doctorate in Music, sitting her exams with the Royal University of Dublin. She graduated with a BA in 1887 and a Music Doc in 1889, 
making her the first woman to receive a doctorate of music from that time in Ireland and indeed all of the British Isles. This was a remarkable achievement and one that was still against the normal expectations for women in 19th century Irish society. In fact, in the second half of the century, as opportunities in education for women began to open, much of society was fearful of the changes this would bring about. For example, there was a fear that educated women would forsake their natural role as mother and wife in favour of pursuing an education or worse still, put their education to use by working. However, with the creation of the Royal University of Ireland, women such as Annie Patterson got the opportunity to pursue a higher education and put it to good use. Upon receiving her doctorate, Annie Patterson held an education greatly superior to many of her peers, both male and female. Between 1887 and 1897, she worked as an organist and an examiner. In 1891, she founded the Dublin Choral Union and was conductor for the first few years. She saw it as a method of encouragement of Irish and local talent. Her position as a conductor was unusual for women because this was one area where they were still very much dominated by men. The fact that Annie Patterson managed to cross this barrier is a testament to her education experience and also her reputation in Dublin. In all the areas of music that she was involved in, Annie Patterson aimed to promote and increase the style of Irish music relevant to the musical scene of that time, and also to encourage people to become more aware and interested in Irish music of the past. Annie Patterson composed a large number of works ranging from oratorios and opera to piano music, all based on Irish themes and folklore. Unfortunately, only a small number were published, and these were mainly the smaller works, such as her songs and piano arrangements of Irish airs. The songs included six original Gaelic songs, the rallying songs of the Gaelic League and King Cormac, and a number of songs that are currently being researched and performed by the Royal Irish Academy of Music's PhD student, Roisin O'Grady, under the guidance of Denise, a fact that I believe would make Annie Patterson very proud. While many of the songs remain, none of the scores of the larger works have survived. Her list of unpublished compositions included an oratorio entitled Meta Tauta, two Irish operas, Ardry's Daughter and Usheen, a school cantata in Irish, an Irish cantata, Irish tone poems, six preludes and fugues for the piano based on Irish folk songs, and several original dances and sonatas for violin and piano. It is unfortunate that none of the scores of these works have survived. However, from just seeing the list of titles, it is evident that Annie Patterson's compositional output was entirely inspired by and based on Irish themes. She experimented with many of the most popular compositional structures and combined them with traditional airs and harmonies. Several of the works were performed and praised during her lifetime, and it seems handwritten copies of the scores were made for such performances. And this here is a note from, from Patterson to W.H. Trundle, who was a teacher of percussion in the academy in the 1890s. And in the note, she's asking him to make several copies of the piece that she's included. Speaking of the many pieces that have been lost by Annie Patterson, during my research, I was eager to find one such piece entitled The Bells of the Shandon. In her later career, Patterson moved to Cork, where she became organist at St. Anne's in Shandon and examiner at the Cork School of Music, before taking up a lectureship at University College Cork from 1924 until her death in 1934. During that time, she composed a piece called The Bells of Shandon. I searched high and low for this on every corner of the internet that existed in 2009, but never found it. Until last year, when I was going through the archives of Sing Ireland, and guess what was there? So now my next challenge is to find a willing choir to perform it and expand our perspective of Annie Patterson's work. And I can see many of my friends and colleagues from Sing Ireland are here today. So who knows, somebody might take up the challenge. Throughout the 1890s, Patterson wrote articles for the Weekly Irish Times, which focused on the musicians and musical life of Dublin. And many of those have become the resources for which I've referred to throughout today. As well as this, in the early 20th century, she moved away from writing articles in favour of writing books. And over the course of the next 20 years, Patterson wrote books on all types of topics. The common element of each of them was that she wanted to focus on how to make music more accessible to the people she was writing for, how to encourage people to have a love of music, 
and how to make sure that they felt that they could approach it in any way they wanted. The books included the story of the oratorio, a book on Schumann, chats with music lovers, a book which is dedicated to Jenny Lind. And again, anyone who's ever watched The Greatest Showman will know of Jenny Lind, but this book was one of the first biographies dedicated to a female performer. She also had a book on how to listen to an orchestra and the native music of Ireland. To conclude, the 19th century brought about significant changes and developments for women who were working in music. They began to share a place for themselves, to shape a place for themselves within the music profession, earning salaries that provided them with equality to their male peers in a society that remained fearful of the inclusion of women in any profession. While women involved in music managed to achieve levels of equality that were progressive for the 19th century, they still didn't came against opposition from their male peers in society for decisions that really pushed what was perceived of a role, the role of woman in life at that time. This often occurred in the areas that presented the biggest threat to the ideals held strongly by men and often religious orders. And these were the creativity and design of a composition. This was too artistic for a dignified woman. Writing letters to a teacher whose advice provided the pillars for career development and success. This was too emotional and undignified. But for many of the women involved in music in Dublin in the 19th century, they seem to have received a significant amount of encouragement and support from their male peers. And unlike some of their European counterparts, they did not seem to have ever been held back or discouraged from pursuing their musical life. On the contrary, they were given guidance, tuition and enthusiasm. Exploring their work and the writing, reviews and documentation that exists about them and by them has made me consider the importance of music in their lives and the freedom and opportunities it provided them. It also leads me back to the question that I have been so regularly asked, were they good enough? This was something I always struggled with, good enough in comparison to who? Those in Europe with greater opportunities for education and training, their, ma their male peers whose responsibilities to family and home were very different. And finally, what is good enough? Researching the work on any minority group at any time in history changes our perspective on the story. In music, there's a place for the excellent, the good enough. And for many of you here today, you've already reached that point. But who supported you on that journey? Was it a dedicated choir teacher in primary school or a hardworking piano teacher whose house you visited every week when you were young? Was it the exceptional musicians and teachers who've guided you to be where you are right now? because every one of them was good enough at one point in your life to contribute to your story. And all of these women, and so many more that I've not spoken of today, were good enough to begin changes to musical life in Dublin and in turn in Ireland that many of us benefit from to this day. Their dedication to the Royal Irish Academy of Music laid down the foundations of the inter internationally recognized institution it is today. Their ideas, determination and drive began the Feshkiol competition that so many of us continue to attend and compete in. Their exploration of composition sowed the seeds for a path forward for female composers in Ireland. And while it was not an easy one in the 20th century, and there is still much to do in considering diversity and inclusion in the compositions we program and the music we showcase, their contributions were significant for the beginnings that they put in place. For me personally, my research into them has defined me in every area of why every area of my work since I first embarked on it. They shape my perspectives and my approach to how I work in music, where I try to consider who is being forgotten, whose work, determination, enthusiasm needs to be heard to be, and to be seen, and whose contributions need to be appreciated and supported. The question of what is good enough is one that is always part of our musical journeys. It's one I think of a lot in my recent work with Sing Ireland and that my colleagues and I have discussed greatly in what we're doing. The experience of a singer living in direct provision centre in Tipperary or Clare who works to commit to turning up and singing together once a week is not the same as that of a singer who has access to a printer, an iPad, a keyboard and time, food and money to allow them the comforts of regular practice. But are they both good enough? The answer is of course yes. Both stories are worthy of recognition. Both journeys will lead them to a place where music has a place in their lives. And looking at music in 19th century Dublin through the lens of gender 
encourages me to consider those stories we are still leaving out. What stories and people today should be part of the histories of tomorrow? And what can we all do to make sure that their perspective is included? Thank you.